Welcome to Conversations on Teaching Europe, a series of brief video segments for educators in secondary classrooms. Conversations on Teaching Europe is brought to you by the European Study Center at the University of Pittsburgh and is funded by the U.S. Department of Education. My name is Kathy Ayers, Outreach Coordinator with the European Study Center and your host for today's talk. Today I'm here with J.J. Spoon, um, a faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh's Political Science Department whose research focuses on political parties and voter behavior in Europe. And we will be discussing the Brexit referendum that took place on Thursday, um, June 23rd, 2016. So to begin with, um, what does the term Brexit mean? And how did this referendum come into being? How, how is this vote called and why? Two very good questions. Um, so Brexit refers to the British exit from the European Union. So it was uh, a term coined um, as uh, a, a way to uh, quickly refer to campaign. Um, how the referendum came to being was uh, in the general elections last uh, spring of 2015, um, David Cameron of the Conservative Party um, was very concerned about a political party um, and what uh, voters were going to do uh, to his right, the United Kingdom Independence Party. And by its name, one can tell that the goal of this party is to take the UK out of the U European Union. And because there was a lot of concern, some um, within the, the Conservative Party, but also among voters, that there was going to be a uh, run to the UK Independence Party in the election, Cameron said, uh, as a way of keeping these voters inside of the party and voting for the party in the general election, that should he get elected and should the Conservatives uh, hold the government, that he would call a referendum on the UK's status within the European Union, um, by 2017. Um, he won, we had the, the Conservative Party taking over the government, and so holding true to his word, a referendum was scheduled for uh, the spring of 2016. Okay. Can you explain the two sides of the debate prior to the referendum? Why did some Brits want to remain in the EU and others want to leave? So the campaigns were uh, aptly named the Remain side and the Leave side. The Remain side very much um, was more unified uh, in terms of a, of a campaign. And they were very much focusing in terms of what their, uh, their, what they were focusing on was very much that the UK would be better in Europe. Um, and if you looked at it, it's the leaflets that they were using, the, you know, the things that they were handing out to voters, the campaign ads, it was all about uh, uh, that the UK would be better off and that British citizens would be better off economically, socially, um, their future would all be better off within the European Union. Um, the Leave side was much more interesting in that there was originally several Leave campaigns. Um, those that were focusing more on the economy, those that were focusing more on immigration, one that was tied very much with the United Kingdom Independence Party and its leader, Nigel Farage. Um, in the end, the um, one campaign was chosen as the official campaign. And why this matters is because uh, political parties uh, in the UK get free advertising time on, on TV. So unlike in, in the US context, where presidential candidates have to raise lots of money to get 30 second spots you know, um, that um, are flooding our, our, uh, our TVs um, and have been for a while, in the UK they are given specific time on, um, on TV um, each, pol each political party is, or each side of an issue. So in this case, since it's a referendum, the Remain, the official Remain campaign was given so many, so much time on TV to run what they call party political broadcasts, which are basically long ads, and the Leave side was. So it was important which campaign was chosen on the Leave side. The more moderate campaign was chosen, and they focused much more also on the economy, right? That whereas the Remain side really said, you know, the UK is better in the EU, the Leave side basically said that the UK is worse in the EU, mm -hmm. that all, all sorts of money is being sent to the EU, we never see this money, we're just helping all of the other member states, and that if we, that if we vote to remove ourselves from the European Union, that all of this money will stay in the EU, excuse me, stay in the UK, better our education, better our, our health care, and really help the domestic economy. So we had sort of an economic uh, argument on both sides, but from very different perspectives. Um, on the Leave side, there was also sort of an anti, a very strong anti-immigration 
piece to this, not as much by the official campaign, but by some of these periphery organizations and the UK Independence Party, mm -hmm. that were really making this an issue about immigration. And by being in the EU, we, there, were, there were just floods of immigrants coming in, that this was hurting the economy and hurting the well-being of the average British citizen, and so really focusing it on, on immigration. And so that, that was a piece of the, of the campaign as well. Okay, thank you. And so now that this referendum has been voted on, and the UK has voted to leave the European Union, how does a country go about actually leaving the EU? Well, uh, <laughs> this is not something that has uh, a lot of precedence. Um, there's been a sort of a, a sort of an interesting side note that uh, the, there has been one other experience where uh, a country has left the EU and not even really a country, but Greenland, mm -hmm. which is uh, since the early 80s has autonomous status within Denmark, was able to determine its relationship with the European Union. And so in, I think it was 1982, uh, the, uh, Green, the Greenlandic citizens voted to um, take themselves out of the European Union. Um, again, this is Greenland and not the UK, so didn't create a whole lot of, <laughs> um, but that was that's sort of the the, the one other example that um, is being is being referred to. Um, the EU does have um, a process in place um, for a country to basically remove itself from the European Union, and it's called Article Fifty. Mm -hmm. um, before that can happen, obviously, an individual country has to decide if. Well, one, if it wants to sort of remove itself from the EU, is this going to be through a referendum, which is what we saw in the UK? Is this going to be um, a vote in Parliament, etc.? So that's kind of on the domestic side. But in the in this case of the UK, the referendum was called, as we know, the referendum passed, mm -hmm. and so now um, it's up to the Prime Minister, which is a new Prime Minister, is not, it, uh, David Cameron, who was the Prime Minister called the referendum, stepped down, mm -hmm. now of Theresa May, who is the Prime Minister, and it's basically up to her to um, trigger Article 50, mm -hmm. which basically means that once that is triggered or started, it's a two-year process for sort of extricating the UK from the EU and negotiating all of the various trade deals, the relationship with the EU and the other member states, because we can't just all of a sudden uh, pull it, say, okay, the UK is not in the EU anymore. Any any trade deals, any relationships, those are all over, mm -hmm. right? The UK has been in the EU since the early 70s, and there's a lot of many years of negotiations and treaties and relationships, and so this process will take a couple of years. Um, in the new cabinet with the new prime minister, there is a minister of Brexit who will basically be the lead negotiator in all of this. And so, um, you know, this will be a, a, a long negotiation process that is not just one-sided. It, it is between the UK and the other 27 member states, which all have to agree to what the terms of this are. So this is not a fast process. Um, this is going to take a while. <laughs> um, and so, you know, now this, this vote has been decided, and of course there's going to be impact on different groups. In particular, to start off with, how is this going to affect UK citizens and EU citizens that are currently living in the UK? So I think right now it's a lot of unknowns, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of you know, trying to figure this out. Right? No one expected this to happen, and mm -hmm. so there was a lot of speculation, but not a lot of uh, definite answers. Um, so the I think from a citizen's perspective, whereas you know a UK citizen could live and work in the EU um, as a member of the Euro as members of the European Union, th that will most likely be more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, for EU citizens that work in the UK, again, that will also be more complicated because the EU has had sort of an open employment policy um, for the last uh, several years in which if you are a citizen of the EU, you can move freely within the EU, but also, you know, have the ability to work in any of the member states. Mm -hmm. um, the UK, importantly, was never part of the Eurozone, so will keep its currency, mm -hmm. so we'll still, the, the pound sterling has been its currency, that will, will stay. The UK has also not been part of Schengen, which is sort of an open borders um, piece of the EU, not all member states are part of this, so within the continent, 
if a country is a member of Schengen, a, a citizen, for example, of France can go to Belgium without having to show their passport. Mm -hmm. But because the UK hasn't been part of Schengen, the French citizen will still have to show their passport and vice versa. So that may not change. But sort of working arrangements, travel, you know, sort of arrangements may, may change. Something that is being discussed is what will happen with the border between the UK and, um, excuse me, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, obviously, now it becomes a border between the UK and the EU. And for the last, uh, you know, 15 years or so, that's been an open border. And so the question is, you know, will that remain? So will a citizen of Belfast in Northern Ireland be able to just cross into the Republic of Ireland, or will there now have to be a border, um, you know, and border controls and things like that? Mm -hmm. There haven't been. So lots of unknowns, but again, the, because citizens are no longer part of the EU, things probably will change. Right. And this is also, uh, you know, brought up questions about um, the UK's. Uh, the country as a whole, mm -hmm. and perhaps Scotland and Northern Ireland, and mm -hmm. and they're staying within the United Kingdom as well, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, and so Scotland actually had a referendum in 2014 on whether to leave the UK mm -hmm. and become its own country. That did not pass, so as of right now, the Sc Scotland is still part of the UK, although Scotland overwhelmingly voted for Remain mm -hmm. uh, in the referendum campaign. And the uh, First Minister of Scotland, the equivalent of the Prime Minister in Scotland, the next day after the Brexit vote already was, you know, trying to uh, talk to representatives in the EU to assure that Scotland would have, still have a relationship with the European Union, um, even if the UK or when the UK leaves. Um, the question of Scottish secession is not off the table. The fact uh, that that the Scottish National Party as a party and most Scottish citizens are in favor of the EU, that could mean that that triggers the uh, another referendum on Scottish secession because they want to stay in the EU. Um, I think that is more likely than perhaps the Northern Irish trying to leave the UK. That that has not been really part of the discussion, but since. It has been in, in Scotland, and you've had a referendum recently. You have a political party whose very clear stated goal is for a independent Scotland. I think we may we may see that. So what you know, so the the Brexit vote not only could well, will eventually lead to the U to the U S. Excuse me, the U K. Leaving the EU in some form, it could also lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. So it's a lot of a lot of things that that could happen from in terms of the fallout. Of and how might this decision impact the EU as an institution? So I think um, in terms of, um, you know, the EU as an institution, you know, while much of the vote was, or much of the reason that voters were voting on one side or the other was not necessarily about Europe. In referendum campaigns, it's often referendum elections, it's often a vote against the government. Right, it's not necessarily a vote on the issues of the referendum, and voters are also very much swayed by what the leaders of the campaigns are telling them, even if that's not necessarily what the issue is at hand. Um, having said that, though, there really was sort of an underlying kind of belief that there was, you know, not all was right with the EU, not necessarily in addition to just the relationship between the UK and the EU, but that there was, you know, there is some. Um, dissatisfaction with the institutions of the EU, with how it's run, representation, and things like that. So I think, while perhaps not immediately, this may be cause for reflection on the institutions of the EU. Um, this may, this will obviously have implications for trade policy and security relations and things like that. Now that the UK, one of the larger economies within the EU, is no longer in the European Union, and so I think you know that that. We'll be seeing lots of um, changes, both from an institutional perspective, but also from the relationship between, let's say, the UK and the EU as well. And then finally, um, what effect might this have on the United States? Again, another good question. Um, in terms of how this may affect the US, obviously the UK is one of our largest trading partners, as is the EU. The fact that the UK is no longer in the EU, right, that may have some you know, major implications for you know our trading relationships and you know sort of where our focus is. 
um, from you know the perspective of the of U.S. citizens. You know, I, I don't think that's the, this is going to have much of an influence. You know, between for example, you know, citizens, you know, Americans going to going to the UK, going to Europe, that kind of thing. But I do think that it will influence from a business perspective, from an economic perspective. There, there will be some implications of this. What they are, it's not completely clear because it's also not completely clear what the terms of the negotiations are going to look like. Again, because the UK isn't just going to drop everything and, and you know, it, it is going to be a negotiation process. So I think, you know, we, we can have this conversation again in a year and, and, <laughs> and I think we'll have a better sense of sort of the, the what, what some of those um, implications are going to be. Well, thank you very much to Dr. J.J. Spoon um, for joining us here today and helping to explain the Brexit. And we hope to um, speak with you again on another topic for Conversations on Teaching Europe. Thank you.